If you've ever had the opportunity to experience a solar eclipse, it is magical and a little eerie. When the moon goes across the sun and the solar eclipse appears, the world becomes a little darker, a little bit cooler and unfamiliar. On August 21st, 2017, the United States experienced, quote unquote, the great American eclipse. This was a total solar eclipse that went across the entire United States. But for Shannon and her husband, they remember this day a little differently and for a different reason. This was the day that they received an email confirming that their daughter had 22Q. From what Shannon shared with me, it was sort of like a total solar eclipse on their life. A little shadow that was casted over them with uncertainty, questions, and made them feel unsettled. I'm honored to introduce you to Julia's mom, Shannon. Welcome to the 22Q Podcast. My name is Becky Way, and today I am so grateful to have Shannon with us. She is here to share all about her daughter, Julia. Shannon, welcome, and please introduce yourself. Thanks, Becky. Um, I'm Shannon Swiger, and as Becky mentioned, I am the mother of a beautiful little girl. Uh, Her name is Julia Bell Swiger, five years old. (laughs) Thank you so much for being on. I think it's really important and awesome that you are willing to share her story with us today. And I just want to, I guess, start at the beginning, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do for work and where do you live? Absolutely. So I live in North Carolina. Uh, My family and I are located in uh, Carolina Beach, which is just south of Wilmington. And for work, my background is in journalism, specifically public relations and communications. And so I've pretty much spent my whole career, uh, the past 15 years or so, working in healthcare marketing and communication. So I work for a large company called Novant Health. We have about 15 hospitals and many, many doctor's offices, Um, but my whole job um, as a director of internal communications is to uh, share news and what's happening with our nurses, our doctors, um, you name it, and um, that's actually been fairly helpful, I think, in my 22Q journey because I speak a lot, I fortunately speak a lot of the, uh, the language, so to speak. Um, and I live with uh, my husband, Chris, who is also in the medical community. He is an adult cardiologist. And then our two children, so Julia, my 22 cutie, and uh, Luke, her little brother, he is two years old and very busy. It sounds it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, two, one, five, one, two, that's a lot. Yes. Our house is, is very chaotic, but it's, it's great. We love it. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning of when you first got pregnant with Julia. So Julia is my first child. So I was pregnant with her. I was 30 at the time and I, you know, just was having a typical pregnancy. I mean, it was my first pregnancy, so I didn't know any better, but it seemed typical to me. And I went in for my anatomy scan. It was actually the day of my 31st birthday. And my husband and I were there and didn't really even notice that the sonographer, you know, she left the room. She's like, oh, I'm just going to kind of check. I'll be right back. And we were just kind of ooing and aahing over her little fingers and toes and, you know, all the things. And then a radiologist came back in the room and said, Hey, we see some things that uh, aren't quite normal on your scan. Um, Julia was missing a kidney. She only has one kidney. And then there was some other um, minor issue that turned out to be nothing, but that kind of tipped us off to say, Hey, you know, you should probably get this investigated. And so at that point, We were referred to maternal fetal medicine, decided to do the amniocentesis, and then my testing results uh, came back. And it was a little bit kind of dramatic the way that we found out, or at least I'm sure it probably feels dramatic for everybody when you get unexpected news. But it was actually, all my testing almost had come back. I really had been reassured, hey, everything looks good. You know, don't worry. And then it was the day of, um, uh, there was a solar eclipse that day, actually. This was back in 2017. I lived in Nashville at the time. 
And so I went out at lunch to like go watch the eclipse. Now I was wearing glasses, <laughs> unlike, you know, uh, some others who maybe weren't. And I was sitting out there watching this like beautiful, crazy kind of celestial event. And I came home and I had an email. I had a message um, from the genetic counselor and she said, hey, we figured out what's going on. Your daughter has 22Q11 deletion syndrome. Here's a link, you know, and then of course, when you click that link or you Google it, you're just, your whole world changes. You're like, what is this? I've never heard of this. And you immediately go to all the kind of worst case scenario thoughts and, and, and feelings. Right. And what was that like for you and your husband in that moment? I know your husband has a background in cardiology. So, I mean, and even though you both had experience with the healthcare system and being in that realm, what was that still like for you that it was your kid? It felt surreal. I mean, I just couldn't believe because it really had never entered into my mind. I was like, I'm young, I'm healthy, I run, you know. And so I just felt really blindsided by it all. He actually wasn't there when I got the news. He had gone on a hike several hours away with some friends. And so he was actually out of pocket, couldn't really even reach him on the phone. (laughs) And so I'm kind of going through this um, crisis and I called my good friend, Neil, who I had just been with. And I called another friend. I didn't have family close by at that point. And um, they came over and just kind of sat with me. Well, I just kind of processed. I, I tried to process and really kind of make sense of what was happening. And I had planned to tell him when he got home, but I, he knew he could tell how upset I was on the phone. So he had to pull over on the road and he was upset too. He, he had heard of, um, you know, medical school, it was called DeGeorge syndrome. And so he had heard of it and remembered it. Um, so we were both in shock, I think. Yeah. How could you not be, you know? Yeah. It's, it is very shocking, especially it's being your first child, you get this news. They're not even here yet. Really. They're not, they're still growing inside of you. And what was the next part of the story for you guys? Yeah. So we, of course, you know, wanted to learn everything that we could and we were followed very closely by maternal and fetal medicine. Um, Julia was famous before she was born. We had so many pictures and ultrasounds and, you know, they're trying to look at everything. Um, so it was a lot to process. And I remember going to baby showers and of course I wasn't sharing that news and it just made it really, really difficult. Um, but of course I was still excited, you know, I was so excited, but there just were a lot of other unexpected feelings. Um, and, but I was really glad that I knew because she ended up coming early. Oh, wow. So I had, um, polyhydraminose. Oh, what's that? Polyhydraminose is where you have too much fluid in your uterus. And it, so I had Julia at 30 weeks, almost oh, wow. then, but I looked like I was 40 weeks pregnant. So when she was born, she was a little peanut. She was three pounds, five ounces. At one point she was less than three pounds and she could, she could fit in between at my tank top. Like she oh my goodness. was so small. And, um, so I was glad that I knew, but it was just very kind of a wild ride because she came early and then they stopped my, um, my labor with medications, but then I started to get sick and I got oh. fluid in my lungs and I started to get an infection and they said, okay, it's safest for you both. If we go ahead and let you deliver her, which I did. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the beginning of our very long journey in the NICU, uh, yeah. where she was for five months before we were able to bring her home. Oh my goodness. Five months. Ugh. that's a lot. It felt like five years. It yeah. felt like an eternity. Wow. So I just want to make sure that I'm understanding you're being watched very closely and then you naturally went into labor because of the extra fluid or you were induced. 
I naturally went into the labor. So had okay, at 30 on, weeks. At 30 weeks. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you went into labor, then they stopped your labor. That's right. And then they restarted it. And then they restarted it. Okay. Because I was getting really sick. Oh my gosh. And I couldn't breathe. They had me on oxygen and oh my gosh. Um, I was getting sick and they said, okay, we need to plan B. <laughs> right. <laughs> so was it a to delivery? So did, did she get delivered natural or C-section emergency? She, she got delivered yeah. naturally. Oh, good. Okay. So, yeah. So that was good. Wow. What are like, how was that like a two day period or did that happen really quick? Over six days. Oh my Shannon. Yeah. You were in was, labor for six days. I was, I was, oh um, God. it started on a Tuesday night. You know, I just was, I was having friends like d- dinner with friends, just like pizza at the house. And, um, I went to the bathroom, you know, cause you have to pee 50 million times when you're yes. pregnant. And, um, I, I saw blood and I was like, Oh no, that's not good. And so I came in <sighs> the next morning and I didn't realize I was in labor not just because I was a first time mom, but because of all the extra fluid, like your uterus doesn't kind of do its thing like it's supposed to. And so I didn't, I couldn't feel the contractions, which I guess was maybe like a weird, weird silver lining, but, um, yeah. So then, yeah. So it was, it was a long, um, weird few days and yeah. And then, and then after that, it just kind of continued. So, so they, how was your recovery with your lungs? Was it relatively quick once she was out or was that a long process as well? I was so focused on her that, you know, I I wasn't on oxygen very long. I was on, I had to take, um, uh, a medication they called mag. I think it's magnesium. Um, and to help with my like blood pressure and I, I, you know, I couldn't eat and things like that. And so at first I was too sick and they didn't want to take me to go see her in the NICU. And I'm like, I've been through all of this. Like I need to see my baby. Mm -hmm. And so I was really fortunate. One of the nurses there was a friend because this is the, the hospital that my husband worked at. So we had a lot of friends who really helped us. And she, I remember she put me in a wheelchair with my oxygen and she pushed me over to the NICU so that I could see Julia, you know, in her little incubator. And, and, and when I delivered, um, my husband, you know, he had to make a choice, go with Julia or stay with me. Yeah. Of course I wanted him to go with Julia. I wanted him to be there. I also had to have a DNC. So my placenta didn't come out. So anyways, it was, it was, and so I lost a lot of blood too. So I, my recovery was okay. I mean, it was nothing compared to hers, but between the two of us, we had like 16 doctors in the room (laughs) when I delivered. And, um, I will say my second, you know, I had a lot of debate of whether or not to have another kid, but I really wanted another child and it was totally different, totally normal. And I was like, ah, that was really nice (laughs) after what a dramatic experience. It was the first time. So dramatic is an understatement. That's a lot. That is a lot. And you were in there, you recovered. And then she was in there for five months. What were some of the things that the doctors found while she was in the NICU? Some of the things they found. So she initially had uh, central sleep apnea. It's really common in premature babies. Their brain's not telling them to breathe. Um, she also later had obstructive sleep apnea, which was something we dealt with even long after we left the hospital. She really had a dependency on um, breathing support for quite some time. We had difficulty weaning her from the CPAP machine. She really needed that to help her breathe. And even with that, she tended to struggle. She had difficulty managing her own secretions and swallowing. And they figured out Part of that, but they didn't figure out the full picture while we were there. She did end up getting a G tube to help her with eating because she wasn't able to swallow um, or eat. And fortunately, for we were really fortunate, her heart was okay. We did not have the heart defects, and she has her thymus, so we did not have some of the challenges that others have with mm-hmm. your thymus. We've had some immune system things, but nothing to mm-hmm. that level or degree. So it really was mm-hmm. breathing, managing secretions and, and eating were really kind of her greatest challenges. And then of course she had a couple 
complications while we were there and those were setbacks. Mm -hmm. What were those if you don't mind? Sure. Sure. So she, she got rhinovirus twice. Um, you know, it's the common cold, but in a premature baby with, you know, a lot of needs, um, it was really, really serious. And the first time that she got rhinovirus, she also got what's called neck at the same time. What's that? It's NEC, it's necrotizing enterocolitis, mm-hmm. if I'm saying that correctly. But it, essentially what it is, is um, it's a it's a breakdown in the GI system of the child. And so her nurse caught it really early that she had blood in her stool and it can be really serious. And so we were really fortunate her nurse caught it early. Wow. They stopped feeding her. Um, until her bowel could recover and it was safe for her to eat again. It's another common complication and, you know, Mm -hmm. premature babies. Mm -hmm. Wow. That isn't, that is a lot. And what were those days like? Did you, you can't stay at the NICU? So were you and your husband switching off days? Did he have to go back to work? What was that five months like? Yeah. So I did stay every day. I was really fortunate. I'm still fortunate because I have just like the most supportive boss, the most supportive team. I work remotely and that's what I did. I worked from her bedside every day. I went back to work a week after I had her, which was a mistake. (laughs) That was not enough time, but I did take a little bit more and then going back because I really wanted to save that time for when she came home because I knew she was really going to need me course I had no idea at that point that it was going to be so long before she came home she came before Halloween her due date was Christmas like the day after Christmas she didn't come home until almost St. Patrick's Day and I just had no idea and you know a silver lining was that my husband worked in that hospital and so we were both there really frequently and really involved we wanted to be there on rounds every day when all these decisions were being made about her plan of care so we, we were there a lot and we had family come in from out of town to be with us too. And, and our friends worked in the hospital, so mm-hmm. they would come be with us too. That is really rare that you had rare that you had all of those connections there at the hospital, especially your husband works in the hospital. That's fantastic. And I'm sure was peace of mind for him. I don't want to speak for him, but working in the same building, he could still go over there and see her and see you, but I can't believe you went back to work so soon, but you didn't know. So how would you know? know. I I didn't know. And I, and I felt like I needed to stay busy mentally. I mean, what, you know, it's like when you go through something hard, Yeah. like we all do in the 22 Q community, it's like, you gotta have some normalcy. Yep. And what would you recommend for maybe family that are listening to this, that have someone in the NICU, what would you recommend they get or do for those families now that you can share and you've experienced it firsthand? That's a great question. So I think a few things came to mind that friends and family did, you know, meals is always a big thing, providing home cooked meal, or just like a a gift card to Grubhub or Postmates, you know, Uber Eats. Um, That's always a big help. My godmother, um, she was awesome. She sent all these little outfits, like little premature clothing. And um, one of the things that she sent was this pack of milestone cards. And it was so special because it'd be like little things like four pound party, (laughs) like, because you have to celebrate every milestone, right? It's like, okay, you know, all these little moments are, I can breathe on my own. That was the last milestone card that we did well after she left the hospital and just celebrating these special little wins and making it special in a way that, you know, a typical parent has the one month, two month, three month, you know, we weren't getting to do that at home. And so that was really special to us. And then just people just showing up, just being there that Mm -hmm. really um, helped. I mean, just silly things like we would just like play board games in her room. Cause we just, that's where we were. That was our home. Cause we didn't want to be away from her. Right. Um, little things like that really make a big difference. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that perspective. Cause 
I feel that so many friends, like I've had friends that have been in the NICU for a long time. We were in the NICU for only a couple of days, so I can't even, I can't even relate, but it is so good to share those tidbits because people feel helpless and they don't know what to say or do, but thank Mm -hmm. you for sharing those perspectives. That's great. So for Julia, after she was in the NICU, what was next? Like when she finally could go home, what was that day like? And what was life like at home when she got home? Yeah. So that day was so exciting. Actually, just yesterday was our five-year anniversary of leaving the NICU. Yay. So it's kind of fresh on my mind. I was looking at all the pictures and videos and um, it was such a special day. We were so excited. And I mean, by that point, you're like celebrity status. When you've been in the NICU that long, everybody knows you. We knew everybody. And so, you know, people were coming out and clapping and giving us hugs and happy tears. And our friends had put up, you know, little welcome home, Julia balloons and signs. And um, we were really fortunate. My in-laws were there to help us with the transition because it was overwhelming the amount of, um, you know, I called them her accessories (laughs) that came home with us, all the things, because we basically created a little NICU room at home and we had home health nurses, uh, which was, we were really fortunate to, to have that. We ended up having those nurses until she was three. Um, wow, that's great. Yeah, that was a huge support because for a variety of reasons, but one of the biggest things is that at nighttime she had trouble with breathing. And so it wasn't safe. Like somebody needed to be kind of looking at her at all times, but it was such a big special moment. We were so glad to just I mean, she was always ours, but just to feel like it was on our terms and in our home and just to be able to have that special time. Oh, I bet that was just like a nice day to take a deep breath and she was home and finally home. Mm -hmm. And when she was home, what was that first year like for you guys? The first year was really tough. We were, you know, back in and out of the ED a lot, readmitted to the hospital. Um, she was really sick. She had a lot of just needs and, you know, we were kind of back at the hospital, the doctor's office, you know, multiple days a week. And yeah, she really had a lot of health challenges, especially with feeding and respiratory issues continue to be our main struggles. She ended up not being able to tolerate her uh, feeds with her G-tube. So we ended up having to get a GJ tube which is a little bit unusual. And it's different because instead of being fed into her stomach, she was fed into her jejunum, which I guess is her intestine essentially. And we did that because her reflux was so bad. She couldn't keep food down or her medicines down. And so that was really amazing because it helped her. She was having a lot of aspiration pneumonia and fevers. But it was also a little bit scary because if it gets dislodged, you have to go back to the hospital. You can't just pop it in. You have to go back to the hospital. She would have to be put under anesthesia and they'd have to put it back in for her. So that made just things a little more nerve wracking, just handling her and making sure that it didn't get pulled out, which of course that did happen a couple of times and we went back, but Mm -hmm. we were glad that we had we had that option because she just couldn't yeah. tolerate her feeds. Um, the other thing was the oxygen and breathing at night. And she needed to be repositioned a whole lot because she couldn't, she had that obstructive sleep apnea and her tongue would kind of block. So kind of like counter to every other baby, you know, say back to sleep, she needed to be on her stomach because otherwise she couldn't breathe. And so, um, you know, you just learn there are just these differences, different needs that your kid has um, that are really different from other babies or children. So we had a lot of nursing support, a lot of sleepless nights. And, um, and then she turned one, a lot of pneumonias. And after she turned one, at this point, we moved to North Carolina. So we were kind of like new home, fresh slate, you know, and at that point, we figured out why she couldn't swallow or even swallow her, her spit, essentially. It was, um, she had an esophageal stricture. Okay. And what is that exactly? An esophageal stricture is basically a closing or a narrowing of the throat. So her throat was like 
the size of like, it was as wide, it was millimeters wide. It was like as wide as, um, uh, you know, maybe a centimeters, like a fingernail, <laughs> like it was really small. So basically it's like her throat's a straw. So that's why she couldn't, you know, in addition to kind of the general feeding and swallowing challenges that can come with 22Q, that was something that was overlooked and that I've been told by our 22Q doctor is fairly unusual. Like a lot of our kids and, and adults have these midline differences, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but this esophageal stricture was somewhat unique, or I haven't really heard of, um, I've only heard of one other family that had some kind of esophageal issues that were somewhat similar. And so that day was amazing because we finally had this answer. Like they went in to look with a camera and we're like, here we go again, but they figured it out. And so they were able to dilate her throat and like, wow. voila, like she could eat. Of course it wasn't that easy. She had oral aversion. It was incredibly scary. We went through a lot of therapy for yeah. her to be able to eat and drink, but we finally had an answer mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, her throat though, the first time it only stayed open like 17 days, I think. And oh, really? it closed again. And so we had to have her throat dilated, I think like 10 times Whoa. for it to stay open. Okay. So, you know, we go in, get anesthesia, have her throat open back up, and then she'd be okay again. You know, we wouldn't have the fevers. We wouldn't have like you could you could just kind of hear it like you, when yeah. her throat closed like that junkiness kind of in her upper respiratory. Um, but we finally had an answer. So we could at least like do something about it, which I feel like is so often, at least where I feel frustrated. It's like, yeah, there's these new things that come up and you're like, okay, well, what do I do with that? And you just like scour mm -hmm. the internet <laughs> trying to figure yes. it out or the 22 Q groups, which are so yep. Wow. So she's undergone anesthesia 16 times a lot. Yeah. Between in her short little life. Wow. That is a lot. So now with her throat, will you have to continue that procedure for the rest of her life? Or will she eventually come strong enough and gain tone as she gets older, where it will just stay open on its own? It's knock on wood. <laughs> it has stayed open for the past two years. So we did this a lot, really frequently. And, um, I actually was just kind of worried about this on Friday. She was complaining of her throat and the school nurse called me. She was like holding her throat at school. I'm like, is her throat closing? I don't think so. She's fine. She's eating fine. She just, you know, had a bug, but you kind of go there immediately. Yeah. Right? And um, so it's stayed open. We may need to do it in the future, but we've been really lucky that it seems like it's staying open. Good. That's so yeah. wonderful. She, she was able to transition from the G G J tube. <laughs> and go to solid foods. I'm sure that was a hard transition and it probably took a little while, correct? It did. It took a to long get her. time. We yeah. went from the GJ to the G and we kept her tube in for a while longer just because of the pandemic. And uh, we just wanted to, yeah, we were just worried, paranoid. And so she's, she's had that out now for a couple of years. Wow. And yeah, so she had a lot of, we did an intensive feeding program uh, to overcome the aversion and that really helped her because of course it was really scary for her to eat yeah. and drink, drink, especially. Um, mm -hmm. so that helped a whole lot. She's still selective, but she's, she's much better. Yeah. And in those first couple of years, do you feel that you and your husband and Julia were just kind of stuck at home because of all of the equipment and fears of I don't know. I don't want to speak for you, but what were the, like, it sounds like a very isolating time for you guys due to all of her health concerns. It was very lonely because it was very lonely because your experience is so different from what others are experiencing. And yeah, we felt, we felt, I was really my husband and I, we, we got a lot closer. I mean, we've always been close, but I feel like having each other and really being a team and being able to talk about things was really, really helpful because, you know, people don't know what it's like to go through that. And so it was very isolating it, as she got bigger and stronger. We did, we did go out a lot. 
um, with all of her accessories, you know, we had this big suction machine and I'd have to section her all the time and, you know, all the things. But we did. I remember the first time when we moved to Wilmington and we just had so much hope. We're like, it's a new place, a new chapter. And we took her to the beach (laughs) and we were like driving around looking for a parking spot. We finally found a spot and we have her oxygen tank. We have her pulse oximeter. We have all of her things and we get there and she like falls asleep as soon as we get to the beach. We have her little oxygen tank and we're like, this is, this is life. Like we can't, Yes, we're stuck at home a lot, but we have to go out. We have to do things. So we'd bring her. We brought her to like Friendsgiving and she's, yeah, got her little tank and all of her things. And we just, we did. We just brought her because it just was part of our, our life. So yeah, you just reached, reached a point where you're, you had to make a decision. Either Mm -hmm. you continue being in this isolated world to protect her, but also you reach a point where you have to weigh everything and say, she's okay. Mm -hmm. she will be okay. And just have the confidence as her parents that she'll be okay. She's with us. We know what Mm -hmm. to do. And it's, it is hard though. It is hard ripping off that bandaid and like going out into the quote unquote real world (laughs) with your medically fragile child. Yeah. And like, I remember we were always worried about like my son getting a cold or picking up a germ because Mm -hmm. he'd be sick for three weeks and not just one week, like a typical kid. So yeah, it's a lot. And that takes a toll on parents too. I feel just that constant concern and worry for them Mm -hmm. that you don't want to make the wrong choice. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure, isn't it? You just like, I feel like I'm constantly like, even now I feel like that all the time. Like right now for us, it's like, okay, we're doing a lot of therapy. Is it too much therapy? Is that, and then, and then like figuring out like which therapy is more important. (laughs) Yeah. I know we need to like take it easy on ourselves because we play this guilt game of, I do the same thing. My son's an OTPT speech. He has piano in and out um, patient. And it's like, it's like, is this too much? Is this too much for an eight-year-old? And it's like, mm-hmm. well, no, you're you're doing the right things to help him succeed and and make life easier for him eventually. You're making him stronger. It it is. It's like we need to give ourselves a break sometimes. <laughs> no, you're so right? right about that. I need to like print that out and have that. <laughs> yeah, right. We need a reminder. Yeah, I know, I know. So anybody listening, you're doing enough, and you're doing an awesome job. There, I said it. Um, but. So how is she now? You know, she's five years old. Yeah. If you could use one word to describe her, what would it be? Yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, I would say there's a lot of words I could use, but I would say kind. She is the sweetest kid. She is so loving and she's sweet with her little brother. I mean, if somebody gets um, her teacher at school, a preschool told me this story about how she like tripped or fell and Julia runs over and flings herself on the floor and is like kissing her, you know, foot that she bumped or something. She just is really um, a kind, kind person. And she brings that joy and just light into our lives and into the, the lives of all the people that she touches or meets. Um, she's really a, a happy, wonderful child. And she's, she's funny too. She's got like this sense of humor. And, um, so anyway, it's hard, but I'd say kind. Yeah. That's a common, common thing. A lot of the parents share with me and I know my little guy's the same way, just like innocent and joyful mm-hmm. and kind. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And can you think of a funny thing she said recently that you wouldn't mind sharing? so this is kind of funny. She's really interested in babies and really wants me to have another baby. So she started, she's every day. She does these like self portraits at school. She loves to make art, all painting, coloring, drawing. And so all of a sudden there's this extra family member who has been (laughs) incorporated (laughs) into her portrait. And I said, Julia said, who's that? It's a little baby. She said, that's Callie. I said, who's Callie? She's like my baby sister. She's like, I need a baby sister. And she says, can she come in the mail? Cause you know, we have everything come in Amazon. Can she come in the mail? Can you order a baby sister? <laughs> like girl, I wish it was that easy. If only. <laughs> right. Oh um, man. That's cute. That's cute. Well, your teachers and your in-laws are going to get really confused. If they see that artwork, they're going to be like, what is this? I know. I know. I told her teachers, I was like, I'm not pregnant. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing to tell. <laughs> this is so funny. Um, 
cute. Oh, well, it sounds like she's doing a good job. And how is school going for her? School's going well. She just recently had a big transition where she went from, she started off preschool and she was fully in um, the exceptional children's program. And then we kind of inched up and then she was doing kind of half, half. And she has just recently fully transitioned to being in a general education classroom full time. So that was really great. Um, so she's, she's doing well with school. She does have an IEP and she does get services at school, um, like speech. She just recently stopped doing PT at school. Um, I think one of our biggest challenges right now that we're um, trying to help her navigate, so she was diagnosed with autism about a year ago, and so right now she's she's getting ABA therapy to help, and so one of the things is that she's having a lot of difficulty with skin picking right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's her face, it's, um, her arms, it's, and it's, um, it's just difficult because mm-hmm. it's upsetting to her and it's hard, you know, she's got all these, like, we buy yeah. so many band-aids and, um, yeah. so anyways, she's, and so she was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder as well recently. So we've just started, um, you know, to use some medicines because what we saw is that, it was just kind of like this, like kind of cloud was coming over Julia that she just wasn't that same happy, joyful little girl. She just, her mood kind of changed and she just gets really stuck. She gets really stuck with um, repetitive things that she says or that she does or having mm-hmm. really, things have to be a really specific way. Mm-hmm. Um, Like she wakes up and first thing she's like, okay, I need to have two Mickey Mouse shaped waffles and I need to watch one episode of Mickey Mouse before I go to school. And then I need to listen to this song on the radio. And if none of those things happen, like if we run out of, if the store doesn't have Mickey Mouse waffles, it's like, um, Mm -hmm. just, you know, meltdowns and, and challenging behavior. And Mm -hmm. so that's one of the biggest things that we're having some difficulty now. And that's kind of our next thing to try to figure out and, and help her through. Yeah. And help her through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the ABA therapy helping? I think so. It's really helped her with like some of the social elements or aspects, you know, we just see like so much more variety or confidence in being able to go up and talk to other kids and engage and play with them and the types of questions that she's asking and the conversations that we have with her, like in the car, you know, how was your day? Now we can have a conversation around it. And that is awesome. It might not be a very long or detailed conversation, but we can talk about it. Yeah. So I think it's really helped in those areas. And we have seen less meltdowns. I would say what was even more helpful for us that we did before ABA and before we had an autism diagnosis is we did something called PCIT. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. No, what is that? It's called parent child interaction therapy. And it, one of our doctors recommended it to us and it was really, really helpful. It's like, it, it basically is, um, the whole first part, you're just building rapport with your child and you have a certain like scripts that you follow and how you play with them and you're complimenting them on all the certain things that they're doing and, and that you want to see those positive behaviors and you're spending that it's called special time you're spending that time with them it's just five minutes a day obviously you know we spend a lot more time with our kids than that but like very in this very focused way and then from there you kind of introduce this very like regimented um like essentially like timeout protocol um and so it it really it really helped it really worked for us ABA is a little bit different and we're still kind of like new and figuring out but it's more about just positive reward and behavior, which works, but we're, we're still trying to, she's doing great at school and at ABA, we're just having a little bit of a hard time translating it at home. So right, we're still just kind of figuring it out. I would say at the moment, that's all you can do, right? It's just kind of see what works, see what doesn't, what other books or resources have you found super helpful throughout this past five years that you wouldn't mind sharing? Yeah, absolutely. So 
you know, I have a very thumbed over bent corner pages, uh, you know, the 22Q uh, book written by Donna um, Cutler Landsman, of course. Um, I'm sure we all have that on our shelf, but that obviously is the number one resource. The 22Q Family Foundation um, was super, super helpful. Um, one thing that I love and subscribe to uh, that just kind of helps me get little tidbits of like motivation or just like, I don't know, just it's almost like a fortune cookie. It's called Labeled and Loved, Labeled and Loved. And you just sign up for text messages and it's from basically an organization that's a nonprofit run by parents of children with disabilities. And it's just, it's just really nice little texts that come through. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. I will put it at the bottom of the description of this podcast so people can check it out too. That sounds amazing. How, how did you find that? Um, I honestly don't even remember. I just... I feel like I've just spent so much time looking for different resources or groups and somehow I just came across it and I've, I think I've subscribed now for, I don't know, two or three years and I just, it, it really, it really helps me. So yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I'm definitely going to check it out. <laughs> we yeah. all need those little bits of encouragement throughout the day. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. So good. And what has been the biggest struggle for you over the past five years, just navigating Julia's 22Q? I think it's been learning. I mean, there's always like these new challenges that present themselves, right? Mm -hmm. First, it was just, you know, breathing and, and learning to eat. And then, uh, gosh, language. We didn't even talk about that, but, you know, we learned sign language and we use sign language and, and now oh, we did talk. too. You did really? Yeah. Yeah. Was it helpful for you? It was super helpful for my son because he did, he was nonverbal until four and a half, five. So we wanted to give him language as I'm sure you did too, just mm -hmm. because we knew he wanted to say things. So it was super helpful for us. What, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. Um, just, we wanted her to be, we wanted to be able to talk. And so yeah. we did, um, you know, a lot of the baby sign language and baby joy, joy and all the different, you know, um, signing time and we loved it and it was super, super helpful. And then we ended up finding out that Julia had a semi-mucosal cleft palate. And when they fixed that, she was actually able to produce certain sounds and, and it just, wow. I mean, it still took a lot of therapy, but now it's like, she can talk and she can sing yeah. and it's just, yeah, it's amazing. So it was super helpful for us too. But then there was a point where it was like, okay, I was all in on learning it. And her therapist was like, okay, but she's never going to talk if you're only using sign. Now you really need to switch to, so I think that's like one of the things is like flexibility, like, and just needing to pivot and needing to kind of like pause and say, Hey, is this working or is it not working? Like, what do we need to, to do? I think that, that flexibility. And then I would say more recently, just, I'm, I gotta take time for myself. That's something I'm really bad at doing. And I just, but we have to, cause otherwise we're just going to get burned mm -hmm. out. So mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have a great answer for that. If somebody else has a great answer for that, I'd love it's to hear it, but it's just mini breaks for me. Anyway, it, if you have five minutes, go outside, just mm -hmm. sit in the sun. I've said this on another podcast, just go outside, sit in the sun and just reset your, like not with your phone, mm -hmm. just breathe. That's for me. I know everyone's different. Mm -hmm. I think it's just changing those expectations of what our life was before having a 22 kid to, to now is it's just make it work for yourself. But like you said, flexibility and just finding that time for you. Um, I know for me, I, I needed a mental brain break. I've reached the point where I like, I knew I needed one. So like I booked a, uh, we live really close to New York city. So I booked a trip with my best friend. We're going to take the train into the city for the day and then come home and it'll be like a break just mm -hmm. to, cause you do, you need that mental break. I don't know about you. I definitely need that break. And yeah. I'm going to take that advice to heart because yeah. yeah, I definitely feel that I, I did, I did go on a trip with my sister last fall. I felt like I was really just kind of hitting the wall and it was like, okay, need to have a break. And we just went, she's going to visit all the national parks. And so I went with her, we went to a couple national parks and just had that time. But I think you're so right that, you know, obviously we can't always just like go on vacation or something just, but those mini breaks. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I joined a book club 
with some Good. friends and just like once a month we just get together and you know, have some wine talk about the book you know just mm-hmm. things like that I think can help and help us not be so isolated yeah, yeah. Cause you're dealing with so much. It's all her therapies. It's all the unknowns. It's all the doctor's appointments. It's worrying about her. Mm-hmm. It's the simple things. And, and it, it's just, it's a lot. Someone had once told me that caregiver, um, fatigue, uh, is almost as bad as a, a veteran that goes overseas and wow. that pressure and stress that you're always under. And I, I, I think I need to do a podcast episode on on caregiver fatigue and just yeah. you need to be able to take care of yourself otherwise you're you got to fill your cup before you can fill theirs absolutely yeah I, I completely agree with that yeah. it's interesting you say that um so I have a I have one thing that I found really helpful is therapy and I found a therapist she has a daughter with who has a syndrome that it's not 22q but it's charge syndrome which has some similarities and she just she just gets it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's been super helpful, but she diagnosed me with PTSD, like, because of, you know, the, the experience and the trauma and, um, yeah, it's just, it's just hard. And then, and then, and then it's even more hard, like looking at your kid and saying like, I feel this way. How do you feel? Cause I know it is like 10 times worse for you, yeah. you know, because you're the one who's actually going through these different procedures or different things. And, um, and Julie is so tough. I mean, she's so resilient. She is just amazing, but you're just like, it's a lot. Um, a lot. Mm-hmm. but sometimes I feel like I, she, she handles it better than like, I, I worry about it. And, and she's just, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if this is bad to say, but it's like part of, it's partially normalized, right? Because it's yeah. like, you don't know, anything different like that's sort of the experience at least at least at this age I think maybe as she gets older there'll be more awareness of the different experiences yeah but like you said they don't know anything different they're just kind tough as nails Mm -hmm. warriors and this is just their life and maybe one day they'll realize, but it sounds like you're doing all the right things. You and your husband and Julia is so lucky to have you guys. If you were to go back to that moment when you did find out that she had 22 Q and you could go back to that room, what would you say or do for yourself? I would tell myself that there's so much beauty. I mean, I absolutely love being Julia's mom. It is, it is like, it is the best thing that's ever happened to me, you know, being her mom and being Luke's mom, you know, obviously meeting my husband, you know, but I just, she, she's an amazing child and every moment, you know, every milestone is that much sweeter. The, the challenges yes, are so difficult, but it is, it is worth it every step of the way. And that, you aren't alone. There is this whole community of people out here who are there to share their experiences and support you. And I think finding that community and, you know, there aren't other, there's one other 22Q family that lives near me, but just that online community or even like connecting with like Special Olympics or whatever that we've done, I can dance or I can shine programming, like finding others in your community who are going through similar things can be really, really helpful. Of course, your, your friends, your family, your support network is important, but finding people with shared experiences, I think, but I think I would just tell myself to worry less and just to enjoy, don't let those moments get away or just be overshadowed by trying to figure out the future and what that's going to look like. Cause there's so much net or even, you know, the things that are happening now. Mm-hmm. That was a very long answer, but I think I would tell myself all those things because you just don't know and you're just scared. But I would also say like, you, you can do this. Cause I think that's one of the things, like, at least I thought I was like, like, I mean, I, I knew I could, but I wasn't, I wasn't sure I was scared. Like you can do this. Your child can do this and it's going to be okay. Okay. might be different. Things are going to be different than what you thought they were going to be really different, but it was always going to be different. Like you don't actually know what your life is going to be like with your kid, whether your kid's typical or not typical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's a great answer because when you do get that diagnosis, it is, you don't know. You don't know what your future looks like. You don't know if your baby's going to be okay. So it's terrifying, but thank you for answering that. And I think it's a great answer. And I hope it's able to bring hope for other parents that have maybe just gotten the diagnosis and don't know what to expect. So thank you so much, Shannon. Um, and I wanted to ask if there's anything else you wanted to add before we end today. Gosh, I feel like we've um, really covered it, but I just appreciate you creating this podcast and resource. I remember, you know, when Julie was first diagnosed, going out and looking and there weren't any podcasts. So I think this is amazing that you're doing this and sharing the stories, especially because everybody's story is so different. Um, so thank you so much, Becky, for, for doing this and for the opportunity to talk today. Hey, it's my pleasure. And I love this because like you said, every story is a little different, but the same, mm -hmm. they're all warriors. Yes. They all have hearts of gold and they teach us so much about ourselves and resilience. It's, it's incredible, but thank you for saying that. And Hey, as many stories as we can get out there to let people know that they're not alone is really important to me. So, but thank you for sharing Julia with us. I wish you nothing but the best. And thank you again for being on today. Thank you, Becky. Shannon, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing Julia with all of our listeners. You guys started this journey with a solar eclipse but it is clear that the moon has left, the shadow has risen, and sunshine is back on your life. And I am so happy for that. So thank you again. And I wish you all nothing but the best. And to our listeners, thank you so much for continuing to listen, subscribe, and like our podcast. You are helping us raise awareness about 22Q and sharing our stories with the world. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart. And if you would like to contact me, you can email me at 22qpodcast at gmail.com with any questions, or if you'd like to be on the podcast, feel free to reach out to me. And as always, never forget 22q family that you are not alone. Mm -hmm.